The day will surely come. Let's pray. Father God, I, we know it's true. Our days are before you. And we put them before you, Lord, today and tomorrow. We look to the past and we see you. We look to the future and we know you are there. These days will surely come. We ask you to be with us today, Lord, as we share your word and we share community with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Appropriate song, I think, to begin today with as the day surely will come. There is a season for everything. I stand at the pulpit today before a congregation that I love. Some of my family's here. I'm glad it's kind of dark out there so I don't become the crying pastor today. Um, that we love. This will serve as a sort of bittersweet moment as will be my last sermon as a staff pastor here at North Park. But not my last sermon here forever as time and resources permit. Uh, we hope to visit, I hope to visit and be back up here at this platform. Uh, it is a special thing to be ever referred to as Pastor Matt. As you know, the Stimmies are moving to North Carolina. We're pursuing our heart's desire. And we want you to know that we're pursuing God's leading. We are pursuing his blessings. It looks like as of now, and you can pray for us because we're on a path that we don't know what's going to happen each day, but we know we're on it, and it looks like a move will ultimately happen somewhere around mid-July. This is our season. We look back upon many, and I look out, and I see many. You may remember a quote that I shared last fall in a message that I titled Dedication Sunday as we rededicated our church through our seasons. And I shared a quote from Eugene Peterson's memoirs titled The Pastor. Eugene Peterson, who, who authored the message translation, among other books, looks back upon his season as a pastor and he writes this, Congregation is a place of stories. The story of Jesus to be sure my story, your story. I learn my story in the company of others. Each story affects and is affected by each other. We are a congregation. We are looking for meaning in our lives. We receive the good news that God is gracious, receiving sacraments of God's actions in our actual lives, and we bump up against someone else's story. And every once in a while, a shaft of blazing beauty seems to break out of nowhere and it illuminates the companies. I see what my sin-dulled eyes had missed. Word of God-shaped, Holy Spirit-created lives of sacrificial humility, incredible courage, heroic virtue, holy praise, joyful suffering, constant prayer, and persevering obedience. Souls being formed for salvation in a community of worship. That's a congregation. I look out across this room, and that is what I see. Blessed stories and God's glory. Nancy and I cannot begin to thank you for the blessing that you have been to us. We learned our story here. Because that's where God planted us. I learned my story, and we thank you. In our message today, we will turn to God's holy word, and I will share our story. The season he is seeing us through, and it is my hope that we don't just model how to leave. We model how to leave well. God's word has something to say. Life is full of seasons. In fact, there's no escaping it. All of us are in one right now. 
what may that be. Maybe to today's message, and as, as we dig into his word, it will become clearer to you. There is joy, and there is pain. There is triumph, and there is tragedy. There are storms, and there are struggles. There are blessings, and there are things to bear. There are homecomings, and there are goodbyes. And through it all, there is God. Jared Brock writes this, There is a season for everything under the sun, even when you can't see the sun. I look back upon my years and all of the various seasons that I have lived through, that my family has lived through, that my church family has lived through, that we have journeyed through, struggled through, danced through, and have prayed through. Seasons have a beginning, and trust me, seasons have an end. We are part of a divine order, my life, your life, the mighty and the mundane, all beautiful to God. I look back at a beautiful and challenging marriage, 31 years, raising beautiful and challenging daughters, Love you, Mel. Living a beautiful and challenging life of faith. And I look ahead knowing that our move just feels right to the bottom of our spirit, to our very core. Yet we do not know where we will live, where our home will be, where we will fellowship, what school little Dylan Rose will first attend next year. Kindergarten who it will be that we will do life with. So we trust this season to God. Now, because we're on this path and so much is changing, I've actually been traveling some two weeks straight, pretty much. As I've been writing this message, so much has changed. I think we do know where we're going to live. We can continue to pray for that. But if you guys have gone through escrow from selling and buying at the same time, ay ay ay. <laughs> so we still leave that to God but we continue to feel like he has us on a path and he is revealing things in his time. Chuck Swindoll said this, that's what this thing called the Christian life is all about, isn't it? Going yet not knowing. As followers of our Lord, we believe he leads us in a certain direction. I believe that's true, and then it's up to us to trust. The best way that I can explain this season is to say that God is leading us upon a path, a direction. And we know that his path is good, but we don't know its its ultimate end. So we must stay on the path, and we must do life with God. And one thing I've learned about this path, as God gives us direction, there's checkpoints along that path. As your faith is trusted, as there may be narrower ways along the broad path, it's easy to see sometimes, and sometimes you just want to make sure you're on the right path, and we trust him, and we practice our faith. So let's turn to God's word, his word today, and I'm hoping as we share our story that our story can be used in your lives. We'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 today. If you got a handout, bulletin, you see we printed out the scripture for you. If you didn't get one, raise your hand and we'll have somebody bring it for you and you could use this as our scripture passage today and make notes if you like. So raise your hands, okay, ushers come forward and then we'll begin to read the passage together, okay? As we prepare to dig into his word and apply it to our lives, Ecclesiastes is believed to, as we're pretty sure, it was written by Solomon. And it was written towards the end of his life. Ecclesiastes means the preacher or assembly. Its theme is a search for satisfaction. In the end, to be found nowhere but with God. Everything else is meaningless. 
Theologian Norman Geisler explains the book this way. I found it very interesting. According to Jewish tradition, Solomon wrote Song of Solomon in his early years, expressing a young man's love. He wrote Proverbs in his mature years, manifesting a middle-aged man's wisdom. And he reportedly wrote Ecclesiastes in his declining years, revealing an old man, an old man's sorrow. In the twilight of his life, Solomon was preaching it to the assembly. Not just life, but life with God. What he had learned over his lifetime. True life satisfaction is found in the things of God. So let's read Ecclesiastes together. Our verses, our passage. Beginning in verse 1. There is a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Those first couplets written in poem form, that's just life, right? That's just life. That's how life is, whether you know God or not. Now keep that in mind with these next passages because the next part, first part is life, the second part, the way I see it, life with God. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful. Get it? Wait for it. In its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each one of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. Get this. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Other translations say revere him. Life and then life with God. We see in these first couplets, season and time. We see life's cyclical nature. And the first thing that we see, even though we don't like it, is to expect change. And as we expect change, we can go through change for change's sake, or we can do life with God. So appropriate for our message today, we will camp more in the first two verses of these couplets, and then we'll kind of end with the second section. Verse 1. There is a time for everything and a season for everything under the heavens. The ESV says this, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. I always love looking at the Amplified Bible. It says this, there is a season, a time appointed for everything and a time for every delight and event or purpose under heaven. The opening verse is making a statement The events of our lives do not randomly happen by chance. God has a purpose behind them. And this causes me to pause, whatever season I may be in or perhaps you may be in, and to pray and ponder, Lord, what is it that you mean in this season for me right now? Then verse 2, as it opens up with everything, there is a season, there are now bookends for our entitled passage. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot. 
There is a time to be born, and there is a time to die. Together we have gushed at the ultrasound pictures, and we have cradled newborn babies. We have held hands beside the hospice bed, and we have grieved at the graveside, sometimes in the same week. Prayers being lifted at both scenes, God being beseeched, and I have witnessed, and perhaps you have too, that both can be beautiful. Yet God is the key. Coming in and leaving, the, and leaving this world is a time set by God. So then notice how the second part of that verse then reads. There is a time to plant. And there is a time to uproot. I like what the ESV says. It says a time to pluck up what was planted. See, something was planted purposeful. It had meaningful roots. These are considered as we think upon this verse. So I guess I think we can say that there is a time to leave. To uproot where you have been planted. And we must recognize, though, very important, to uproot means that we leave a hole behind. Have you transplanted something before? We must understand that when we uproot, that we leave a hole behind, it also means that the soil must be prepared for where we are going. Roots must be cared for, or there will be stress, there will be stunted growth. Fruit bearing will be affected. So keeping with the theme of Ecclesiastes 3, it is imperative that this is done in season and in a proper time. Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible Commentary says this, A man can no more reverse the times and orders of planting and transplanting than he can alter the times fixed for his birth and death. To try and plant out a season is vanity. God seeks to bless us in his time. And we must be careful not to rush the seasons or his timing. When we do, that's when things kind of get out of whack and they fall apart. So let me take this time. If you haven't heard some of our announcements, let me make it perfectly clear why the stimmies are moving. We have had a heart's desire, and I want to say this sensitive because you all live in California, but to leave California. We have had a heart's desire to move to an area that maybe the cost of living is better. We can smell retirement in our 50s. I'm in my 50s. I don't know where Nancy is. <laughs> and so we're beginning to think about those years and where would we want to be. And the whole family has been thinking those things. So an opportunity came up with my work. In the back of my mind, I always said, if, if the person out there who I know ever retires, that would interest me. And so we began on the process of checking it out and looking more into it. 200 external candidates applied, and I had to compete with all of them. It was a grueling time, a four-month period, not knowing. The HR world today, I know I have some HR people here today, but that was, that was hard to know exactly where we were in that point. But we continued to, to move forward and, and trust in God. I'll be managing 11 southeastern states, and we kind of centered on North Carolina to where we would want to live. A company sent us out there a couple weeks ago. We found an area, and some areas looked at homes, and it was just a wonderful experience. There's sort of a professional desire and a heart's desire that are coming together at the perfect time. And so we continue to move forward to look into that. That is why and how we are going. The four-month process was both grueling and beautiful, even if I didn't get the job. Now, trust me, I would, you would have heard the weeping and gnashing of teeth because I wanted it. But those four months caused us to lean on him and trust him. We prayed. We read scripture. The key to prayer and scripture is that it was already our practice. Like, the work that we have put into dedicating that discipline to him was already in place. 
I cannot stress to you enough to open up God's word and get in some kind of a plan. Because it's already there for you. So we prayed, we read scripture, we sought counsel, we waited on the Lord. It means what it says, waiting on the Lord. You can imagine how we felt knowing that our life was about to exchange, that people were deciding my fate, which leads to my family, which leads to my church. Did a hiring team have this control? Or did a higher team? There were times we were frustrated with the process. Yes, over, yet over the four months, we felt that God just continued to reveal and to show us how we felt when we woke in the night, how it sat with us when we arose in the morning. Feedback we were gaining from counselors, a deepening need, and a dependence on God throughout. I remember saying, Lord, either open doors or slam them so hard in my face it hurts so that I can be clear and know. At the end of the process, there was no doubt. Our entire family, in our hearts, that we would make this move if it was in God's time. If God, if the position was offered, then we would take it. That was our process. And through it all, he gently began to lead us upon that path, and things became clearer as we waited on him, too much for me to mention, but I could probably speak all day on it. I know production's getting nervous. Don't worry, you guys. I'll stay on time. There is a time to leave. But this means that there is also a going. It means a going to something or a going towards something. That God is laying a path. Leaving for leaving's sake can be a can lead to wandering. It can lead to disconnectedness, and we can get lost. We know that we leave a hole behind. But in our going, we believe that he will prepare the North Carolina soil so that we can take root. And we trust that he will fill the hole that the stimmies are leaving in our going. And I do not say this lightly. It is people sitting here today and those he will send that will help fill that hole. And we trust him to do so. Perhaps some of us here today will make the decision to truly put down roots. Let me share with you how God has been walking with us through this season. This is more of my testimony or our testimony, and I want to make it perfectly clear that the path and the points that I am about to share with you came through dedicated time with God, came through looking at his scripture. There's a ton I can share with you on how God's word is doing that as well, but I'll save that for another time as well. In fact, in my reading, I was reading Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel was being called, and God says, take this scroll, his word, eat it. Ezekiel says, I ate it. God says, eat it, digest it, fill yourself up with my word. Ezekiel said, I opened my mouth, I ate it, and it tasted good. It tasted like honey in my mouth. How many, how many, how many had uh, donut holes today? It tastes good. It ingest his word. God says, put it in you so that you can speak it. You don't need a preacher. You don't need to be a, have a pulpit to preach God's word. I will limit it to three points that God taught me through his word. Perhaps there are seasonal checkpoints that may be helpful for you as we do so. And please also know that what I'm about to share with you is not to meant to be formulaic, but applied to your specific situation. Am I clear? This is how God's word, it'll be close, but how it, how it applies to you is up to you and, of course, God. The first thing that we learned in God's word was inquire of the Lord. I mean really inquire of the Lord. Like we say we pray about things. I remember, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I'll share it. Early on in, in my Christianity and in our family, we, we made the mistake 
of stopping in at an auto dealer and look at a brand new car on the showroom floor. We couldn't afford it, but we fell in love with the car. So being a new Christian, I told the salesperson, well, you know, we're a Christian, so we pray about things. So we went to the next room, prayed, okay, let's do it. Went back, <laughs> bought it, and that was paid for that thing for probably 10 plus years because it was just a financial mess. It wasn't a good decision. That wasn't really inquiring of the Lord. Really inquiring of the Lord. In Joshua 9, we were reading in our quiet time. Nancy and I are doing the same study, so it was helpful. And, and God says, I want you to wipe out all this land and take it. And so they wipe out Jericho. They wipe out Ai. And then, the, then God's name is becoming renowned around, around the region. The Gibeonites hear this, and they're like, oh, shoot, man. We're going to be on that list. You know what? Let's pretend that we're from far away. Let's pretend that we're wanderers, and let's go to the Israelites and fool them. So they dress up in old clothes with patches on. They take old moldy food. Their sandals are old and worn. And here come the Israelites, and they say, hey, we've heard about your God, and we want to be with you. Make a covenant with us. And Joshua and the Israelites say, oh, how do we know that you're not from here? Oh, no, 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 no. Look at our food. It's all moldy. Look at our worn-out sandals. Look at how dusty we are and, and how worn out our clothes are. And so Joshua and the Israelites said, okay, we make a covenant with you. Three days later, liar, liar, pants on fire. They found out. They said, why did you lie to us? Because we knew you would wipe us out. So Joshua 9.14, they, they listened to the Gibeonites. 9.14, then the men of Israel sampled their provisions, but they did not inquire of the Lord. I'm pretty good at looking at evidence. I'm pretty good at looking at the facts. But what about laying that up before God? Truly inquiring of him. This verse sent me to my knees like never before. I'm great at research. I can look up reviews on Yelp and everything else. I can crunch the numbers. I can label the variables. I can assess the evidence. And I could gather the spreadsheet. But have I inquired of the Lord? Really inquired of him. Prayer praying over time, praying specifically, journaling, scripture, being in his word, eating his word, and counting the cost, not just finances, but taking everything into consideration, being ready for yes and being ready for no, inquiring of the Lord. The next thing I learned was, big one, patience over pride. In Ecclesiastes 7, I'm reading again, we're struggling, I'm struggling through this time as not knowing my life can change and I don't know what's going to happen. We're doing our homework, we, we can be ready and we're just waiting. And so I often go to, to the word this morning and say, hey Lord, give me something today. Give me encouragement, give me fuel for today. Ecclesiastes 7 I came to and I put verse 1 and 8 together, okay? I'm going to put it together for you. A good name is better than fine perfume. Patience is better than pride. I read these verses in my daily devotional, put them together, I posted them on my desk, and I kept them with me when I traveled. During that time, but towards the end of the four-month process, I was deeply frustrated by the process, how it languished. I was feeling more than qualified. I had the resume. I had the experience. I was already with the company, but I didn't feel like I was being treated as such. I remember praying for God to help me that day to give me something, and boy, did he. And I felt him say to me, Matt, a good name is better than fine perfume, and patience is better than pride. Matt, I have given you a good name. You need to let it be. Just like fine perfume fill in the air. God says, trust not in your resume, but trust in the good name that I give. And such a name does not need, need to boast, but be. And such a name is built by character over time and through the seasons. Inquire of the Lord, patience over pride. The last one, lay it out before God. There's a story of Hezekiah, one of the last really good kings, right? And he received a letter of intimidation from the king of Assyria. And it was a brutal letter. The king of Assyria was really just trying to really scare King Hezekiah. Like, 
he, he taunted God. He just let him know what was, he was going to do and how he was going to do it. And sent a messenger and delivered this really intimidating letter to King Hezekiah. And it was scary. It was a scary thing. In Isaiah 37, verses 14 through 15, we learn what Hezekiah did after getting that letter. Hezekiah received a letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and he spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. And it goes on to pray a very specific prayer. Laying it out, this letter, before God. Hezekiah had much to be concerned with. His situation was overwhelming. And what did he do? He not only took it to God, but he laid it out before him. All of it visualized before God. So again, struggling during this time, right at the peak, I think, when things were happening with us at this time, now all sorts of other worries come in. Oh, shoot. We got a selling of a house, a buying of a house. Where are we going to live? I don't know. All the in-betweens, all the variables, all the unknowns. Worried about too much. And we come to God's scripture in our devotional, and it really spoke to me. Worried about many things, as I just said. How will my family do? Am I doing the right thing? And my worries then turn to questioning God's will. Then I came to that scripture. If I, if I came to that scripture in the past, I'm sure I just probably breezed right through it, right? This time it just stopped me in my tracks, screamed at me. As I said, Nancy's going through the same devotional, and this has been proved to be a great blessing in our lives as we, especially going through this season, I feel like God set that up for us. And we were discussing our pending move and all the unknown. We knew we were on his path, but now we were we were, we were overwhelmed with all the, the, the wondering of what the final would look like. And I said, wait a second. I ran back to my office. I came back with a map of North Carolina, unfolded it, laid it out on our living room floor. I said, let's pray. So with that map, there in our living room in the house that has blessed us for 22 years, kneeling down and praying, Something like this. Lord, we are concerned with many things, but we know you are not. We don't know where we will live, but we know you do. We don't know where we will go to church, but Lord, you do. We don't know who will be our friends, but you do. We don't know where little Dylan Rose will go to school and who she will play with, what neighborhood that she will grow up in. Oh, but dear Lord God of heaven, we know that you do. Father, lead us. Keep us on your path. Your grateful servants. What an experience when we lay it out before him. There's a time to plant and there is a time to uproot what was planted. You were planted in season by divine hands and you will be uprooted in season by those same trusting hands. There are good reasons to leave, and there are not good reasons to leave. In fact, in America, let's face it, it's way too easy to leave anything or anybody, let alone a church. Over the years, I have seen some folks leave fellowship just because others left. But I kind of get that, because there's people we love who leave. We get kind of caught up in that, I think, because they're no longer here. And I want to be honest with you, I have heard some people say to me, that people will leave North Park because the STEMIs are leaving. I am concerned that that may be true. And frankly, it's a concern that we just had to give to God. This is his church. North Park is his. So I want to say this as humbly as I can. Please hear me. If you leave because, simply because the STEMIs are leaving, then I have failed as a leader. But if you have inquired of the Lord, if you have laid it out before him, if you have put patience over pride, then he is leading you. He is blessing a path before you. 
He will fill the hole that you leave behind, and he will prepare the soil to where you are going. So in your going, then we just bless you. And Nancy and I feel blessed by you, and we feel your understanding. This is God's church. We are his people. So now let's contrast what we just learned against verses 9 through 14. We had life, now life with God. This is the insertion of God into it all. An old wise man looking back on his life and preaching it. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. I love that. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Amen. That each one of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all of their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will revere him. The key to this entire passage lies in verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Uh, the Young's translation says he has made everything beautiful in its season. There can be beauty in God's time. So think about it. What happens if I operate outside of God's time? In my intimacy, relationships, finances. See, credit cards never go out of season. They just up your your availability, your limit. How about my transitions, my words, my actions out of season? This is what I think that Solomon was ultimately getting to. Looking back on his life, he saw it all. He saw striving after earthly things, and he saw himself striving them outside of God's timing, outside of season, and he said they all were meaningless, and I had it all. Chuck Swindoll says, 311 doesn't say that everything is beautiful. It says God makes everything beautiful in its time. And my experience of life tells me that even when we act out of season, we go outside of God's lane lines, but still give it to him. He can pick up the pieces and bring beauty from it. Rick Warren says this. He says, some of you are going through a season right now that is not beautiful. It's ugly. Your finances look ugly. Your health looks ugly. Your marriage or friendship looks ugly. Your future looks ugly. But God can make something good out of it if you give him the pieces. I don't know what season you are in. God is not only in season, but God transcends seasons because he loves us. Seek him. Lean into him. Trust him. And I know that for us, this season will lead to another season. I'm not sure in this transition we're in right now even what will happen tomorrow. But I trust in him along the way. It leads us to the close of verse 14. Solomon says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will revere him. God's will be done. We cannot, fathom, we cannot fathom it. Nothing can alter it. And it remains his earnest gift to give us joy in our journey because he has set eternity in our hearts, in your heart. Do you feel it? Do you feel it speaking to you? As verse 13 says, this is the gift of God. Enjoy life. As I shared, we ultimately do not know where we will land, although it's becoming clear. We have an idea, but there is so much we do not know. Nor should we know, nor do we need to know. I want to know. <laughs> Amen, everybody. Look at 14. God does it so that people will revere him. If I knew everything, if I knew the known way, 
I would not need God. I would not have to trust in him, lean upon him, grow from him, feel his blessings in my life. So as I close as my last sermon, as Pastor Matt, I want to share a couple things with you. My parting comments to this church. It's my firm belief that to get the most out of our Christian church experience, we must seek a place to serve, and a place to be known. The first thing that Nancy and I will do as we're looking for a church is to find a fellowship where we can serve. But before that, we will look for a place where we can get into a small group experience. We know that that will help us set our roots. In Christianity Today, Carl Vatters writes this, and I agree. There's only so much growth we can receive as a passive church consumer. As we grow spiritually, the amount we can take from others, even from great sermons and programs, diminishes until we do one thing, start serving. Expecting to grow spiritually by attending church but not participating is like expecting to get physically healthy by eating better but not getting off the couch. Over my 20 years in leadership, I have found this to be true. Over my 20 years of all the programs that I have led, the ministries that I have been part of, I have asked for all kinds of help, for servant volunteers. From the bottom of my heart, everybody has said, yes, I thank you. To all of you who are serving now, as a leader here, I thank you. I ask if you are not serving now and you have the spiritual capacity to do so, that you simply let our staff know. Hand them a card. Email them. Pray about it. Go through these steps that we just went through. And I want to be bold here for a second, too, and I ask that if you're going to begin serving, that you begin with children's ministry. This key and vital ministry has notoriously, not just our church, but many churches, is notoriously understaffed. To be honest with you, we have very low parent participation. So if, you're partic if you have children in at all, I ask you to simply just talk to Kristen today. Overwhelm her. Inundate her. Get on the schedule and then serve the time you're on the schedule. I know of, of, we pour into the family. Revival happens. Just seeing what the kids are going off to camp stirs my soul. So wherever you serve, I ask you to consider that. And I did children's ministry for 10 years. It was always a struggle. I ask you to pray about it, think about it. Perhaps another ministry comes to mind, hospitality, production, or something else. So my benediction to this body then. Minnie Haskins wrote, And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the years, Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than a light and safer than a known way. So I went forth, and finding the hand of God, I trod gladly into the night. And he led me toward the hills and the breaking of day and the lone east. As the stemmies trust in God and as we head east, I leave you with Paul's words from my heart. Nancy's heart. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, I thank you for the seasons that you have given us that we are able to look back upon now, seasons that you lie ahead. Lord, I thank you for sending us and planting us here. And Father God, I pray as we are uprooted, Lord, that we are mindful of it all, that we stay on your path, Lord, that we inquire of you, that we put patience over pride, that we lay it out before you. And Father, I thank you for this people and this congregation that will be forever in our hearts, forever bonded. In Jesus' name, amen.